Chen and I am the president of Political Science Club. 2016 proved to be a milestone year in the, in the fight for equality for women. For the first time, a woman was a presidential candidate representing the Democratic Party. Citizens across the nation gathered together to exercise their constitutional right to vote, including groups that were previously inhibited from voting in U.S. history. Women were denied the right to vote until 1920, when the 19th Amendment was ratified into the U.S. Constitution. Until that moment in our history, women were not given the same rights as men. However, after years of inequality and injustice, there came a time when women said enough and worked towards receiving the right to vote. A step in the right direction proceeding to equality for all. During the time of the women's suffrage movement, there were many prevalent women that fought to accomplish this goal. Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were the first women to really bring the attention of women's suffrage into the United States. After being barred from attending an anti-slavery convention in London, they were inspired to have their own women's convention, historically known as the Seneca Falls Convention in the U.S. in 1948. In 1851, Mrs. Cady Stanton was introduced to Susan B. Anthony, and together they formed a lifelong friendship and partnership committed to women's suffrage. They formed the National Women's Suffrage Association, campaigning for a constitutional amendment to include women in the right to vote. Of course, Mrs. Katie Stanton, Mrs. Mott, and Mrs. Anthony weren't the only women that combined their efforts to work towards the path to women's suffrage. In addition to these women, others put their effort into the fight towards women's suffrage as well. Among them are Lucy Stone, Lucy Burns, and Frederick Douglass, all of whom we will be discussing today. After many years of adversity, the fight towards women's suffrage was over in 1920. We live in a society where women are much closer to equality than ever before, but some may argue that we are not fully there yet. However, women everywhere can learn from Mrs. Katie Stanton or Mrs. Anthony and take the responsibility for change into their own hands. We hope that today's presentation of famous suffragettes inspired you all to make a change in the world. And now, it's time to begin with the presentations. Please welcome Gabriel, who's going to be presenting Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Thank you, Sophie. I'm Gabriel, and I'm gonna be presenting the life and work of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, one of the most well-known figures of the women's suffrage movement. Born in Johnstown, New York, on November 12, 1815, Miss Katie was the daughter of Margaret Livingston and Daniel Katie, the town's most prominent citizens. She reached top level education through her father's informal teachings and through Emma Willard's Academy's formal teachings. Although she showed desire in succeeding in intellectual and other male spheres, Elizabeth Katie was not able to receive a full college education. As exemplified in her words from the Declaration of Rights, we hold these truths to self be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. In her leisure time, she spent uh, with Jared Smith, her cousin, an abolitionist, and learned about the abolitionist, temperance, and women's rights movement. In 1840, Miss Katie married reformer Henry Stanton, forbidding obey from the marriage oath by following his birth, birth surname, Katie, with his birth surname, Stanton. Therefore, the full name Elizabeth Katie Stanton came to be. For their honeymoon, they went to the <coughs> anti-slavery convention. There she met uh, American female abolitionist Lucretia Mott, joined other women objecting their exclusion from the convention, and with Mrs. Mott, vowed to start their own anti-slavery women's rights convention. And they did so when Katie, Mrs. Katie Stanton finally moved to Seneca Falls, New York, and held the Seneca Falls Convention, the world's first women's rights convention. There they drew the Declaration of <coughs> which called for law, changes in law and society to allow for women to gain the right to vote 
and elevate their status in society. It passed after considerable debate, forever changing the direction and the movement, and establishing Sandy as one of the most provocative figures on the subject of women's rights. In 1841, Miss Katie Stanley met Susan B. Anthony and formed a lifelong friendship and one of the most productive working partnerships in U.S. history. Miss Katie Stanley served as a leading voice and philosopher of the women's rights and suffrage movements, and Miss Anthony served as a powerhouse who commandeered the legions of women fighting for their rights. The pair, the pair began their women's rights campaign by pushing for and succeeding in having New York legislature turn the women's, married women's law of property law of 1848 into the married women's property law of 1860, further granting women more property rights untouched by their husbands. By 1862, most of the reforms Mrs. Katie Stanton and Mrs. Anthony sought in one status were secure. The unmarried Anthony later traveled the country delivering speeches that Ms. Mrs. Katie Stanton herself wrote. And although Ms. K Mrs. Katie Stanton, after her children were moved out, went back onto the road to fight for women's rights. It was Mrs. Miss Anthony that took on the face of the women's rights movement. After the war, they became even more outspoken and deep, created deep conflicts among other reformers when they tried to link black suffrage and women's rights. And when that failed, they criticized the 14th and 15th Amendments. They established in 1869 the National Women's Suffrage Association, or Manuel organization, that eventually secured the 19th, 19th Amendment. Mrs. Katie Stanton also strongly advocated for liberalized divorce laws, reproductive self-determination, and sex greater sexual freedom for women making her voice an increasingly marginalized one during the time. In the 1880s, Mrs. Katie Stanton visited England, where she encountered free thinkers and the biblical critics, furthering her hate for organized religion after a traumatic youthful conversion experience. Back in the United States, she learned that the Christian political advocates were trying to make Christianity, the state religion, and undo un divorce law liberalization. And through her opposition of them, Mrs. Katie Stanton, with her daughter Harriet Stanton Blatch, published the Woman's Bible, a controversial critique of the time claiming that religion was the leading cause of women's oppression. Her relentless lack of boundaries for the rights she fought for offended the women's. Christian Temperance Union, a generation of suffrage, suffrage, suffrage leaders, and even Anthony. For this reason, she fell into obscurity, left to be forgotten behind all those she empowered. Elizabeth Cady Stanton died on October 26, 1902, 14 years before women gained the right to vote. More so than any woman in the mo movement, Miss, Mrs. Elizabeth Katie Stanton was able and willing to speak about sensitive topics. As she once said, the best protection any woman can have is courage. She deserves to be distinguished and renowned as one of the most remarkable women during the suffrage movement. For without her pivotal voice, it is possible women would not have the freedom to express their voices.
Uh, good, good afternoon. No. Uh, my throat's a little bit messed up, so if you don't mind, I'm going to be using this. Change the slide. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, today I will be discussing Ms. Susan B. Anthony. Since the start of the women's rights movement, one woman was especially affected, Susan B. Anthony. Most of you may have heard about her, and that's because she was inspired to do many great things. And she's inspired many great actions through, or, through others. This led her to have many monuments named after her, such as the Susan B. Uh, Anthony Museum and other ways. Born on February 15, 1820, to a family that taught her to believe in what is right and fair for all people. Ms. Susan B. Anthony was born to a family of abolitionists who believed that not just one group should be uh, equal, but all people, regardless of their gender, the color of their skin, or the content of the character. Ms. Anthony first joined the women's right movement in 1852 and spent the rest of her life in dedication to women's suffrage. She was determined to make a change in her society. And this is mainly due to the fact that throughout all her life, she was told that she could not do certain things because she was a woman. And she denied this throughout all of her life because she believed that if she put her mind to it, she could achieve anything. And she became so influential that in 1900, she was able to persuade the University of Rochester to finally admit women into their school. This became a plot point for her as she saw that she could make a change. She just needed to outreach her voice. And this became so as because Miss Anthony was an abolitionist and grew up in Rochester in the late 1840s, she formed the American Anti-Slavery Society in 1856, as well as becoming an educator of Kanaone Academy. This became prevalent to her because she felt she needed to teach and educate children about how her society was to her and how the society is now. How it should change and how it should form to give equality for all people, not just men. In 1866, Miss Anthony and Miss Staten co-founded the American Equal Rights Association, and in 1868, she even be, they even began a newspaper called the Revolution. Where they would go out and spread their suffrage movement, which some historians believe that this was actually the first movement, this was the first pivot that paved the way for women's suffrage. It's not until three years later that Miss Stanton and Miss Anthony went across America to try and change the voting laws in order to allow women the right to vote. This became prevalent as in November of night, as when they reached Wyoming, this became the first state that actually allowed women to vote. The other states did not agree with this because they believed on a federal level they would be called against the federal government. Wyoming, on the other hand, believe that there should be a change. There is no history or record of them changing any other laws before the suffrage amendment, but we'll get to that in a second. In November of 1872, Miss Anthony was arrested along with 14 other women for voting in Rochester, her, home, her hometown. The trial against them was that they had no legal right to vote. However, Miss Anthony protested claiming that she had no right as an American citizen to vote just as men did and even protested that due to the 15th Amendment, they had the right, just as black men did, to vote. This trial went on. The verdict was that they were found innocent. However, due to Congress and the Times, they held a whole new trial. This did not point well for them because the trial was then considered a mistrial and all charges were dropped of her arrest, as well as the 14 other women. Miss Anthony went on to legalize the right for women to vote by going with Miss Stanton to propose a new amendment called the Suffrage Amendment. During this time, they would go across each state to get petitions started to get people to sign to make the 19th Amendment. They presented this to Congress over 10 times, and each time they were mocked and laughed at by, by the Continental Congress. So far so that the proposal never even reached President Ulysses S. Grant at the time, so he could never really do anything about it. This did not change anything for them. This did not 
sway their determination in any way, shape, or form. It was not until 1920 that the suffrage amendment became so popularized that Congress approved it as the 19th Amendment. Unfortunately, Miss Anthony was never able to see her achievement due to her dying on March 13, 1906 of pneumonia. Though this does seem sad, Miss Anthony was determined during her old age. She would go and travel periodically during her time as an activist and gave more than 100 speeches yearly trying to change the way society was. It is because of Miss Anthony today that, even in modern times, while we do have equal rights, there are still things we must fight for. This is what inspired her in the beginning, to change the injustices that were brought up in her society, and she died believing that she would be able to change what was any little injustice, whether it be because of pay quality or because somebody believed something because they were white or man. This is important <coughs> because she was able to believe, get other people to believe in her cause. She was determined and she was hopeful that all people would see this, not just women. And as a man, it becomes prevalent that we don't know much of women's suffrage because we don't understand it truly. It is until we do our research and our inspiration that we understand their fight, that we understand that this fight is not yet over, and that we must do all that we can in order to change the course that we're going to. Thank you. He will be discussing Frederick Douglass. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tyler Dean, and I'll be speaking to you about Frederick Douglass today. Most people know Frederick Douglass as an abolitionist but he was also a fairly prominent women's suffragist. However, in order to understand his beliefs and his actions, you have to learn a little bit about his life first. In February of 1818, Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey was born to an unknown white, ma white father and an African slave mother named Harriet Bailey. Harry, Frederick Bailey did not know what his actual birthday was, but he chose to celebrate it on the 14th because his mother always referred to him as her little Valentine. <laughs> During his time as a slave, Douglas' owner was a man named Hugh Ault. Hugh Ault's wife was the person that actually taught Douglas the alphabet, despite there being many laws against educating slaves at the time. Eventually, her husband did convince Miss Ald, Mrs. Ald to cease her education of Douglas, but he continued to read and write in secret, teaching himself and learning new things. In fact, he credited his many readings as the source of his equalist views, arguing that education was the polar opposite of slavery. Bailey did attempt to escape from slavery twice unsuccessfully and was not able to actually gain his freedom until he was assisted by a woman named Anna Murray, who he would later go on to marry. <coughs> the couple chose the last name Douglas as their married name after a character from the book The Lady of the Lake, which they both thoroughly enjoyed. With his newfound freedom and a new name to reflect it, Douglas would go on to speak to people from all walks of life, from common people, writing in newspapers, writing his autobiographies, even speaking with congressmen and other prominent figures. One such figure that Douglas was able to connect with was President Abraham Lincoln, whose signature of the Emancipation Proclamation led to the Civil War and eventually freedom for all black slaves. Once slavery was abolished, Douglas worked fervently for the women's suffrage movement. 
perhaps because it was two very important women that made him the man he had become. Sophia Ald, who had taught him and began his education, and Anna Murray Douglas, his wife who had freed him from slavery. At the request of Elizabeth McClintock, Douglas attended the first women's, women's rights convention in 1848. And as he did with the abolitionist movement, Douglas traveled the country speaking on behalf of women's rights. A particularly powerful quote of his that I enjoy a lot is, such a truth is woman's right to equal liberty with man that she was born with it. It was hers before she even comprehended it. In addition to speaking, he also marched with women in their protests, even though he was constantly being taunted and shunned because of it. In 1866, along with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, he served a minor role in the founding of the American Equal Rights Association. Through his newspapers, the North Star and Frederick Douglass's paper, Douglass helped to keep the women's suffrage movement organized by letting them know when events would be occurring, marches, conventions, speeches. <clears throat> but unfortunately, Stanton, Anthony and Douglas would have a falling out over the 15th Amendment, which granted black men the right to vote, but not white women or black women. Douglas argued with them that white women already had a form of electoral power. They could argue with their white husbands, their white fathers, their white brothers, in order to affect their votes. <clears throat> Ironically, this very power that he decried was what had come to his aid in his quest for abolition. Despite being women, Stanton and Anthony were white women, allowing them to argue and have a bit of influence with Congress in order to help free black men from slavery. This is something that still goes on today. For example, earlier this year, Lindsay Lohan converted to Islam and she was wearing a turban in an airport. Because no one recognized her, she was treated extremely poorly until she did take her, head, or take her turban off. And suddenly people realized, is this really how we're treating Muslims? Her speaking up about her ordeal was what started to bring more attention to a problem that's been worsening since September 11th of 2001. <clears throat> the reverse is also true. Though Douglas was black, he was a black man, giving him a bit more clout when it came to women's suffrage. This made his support and his newly found voting powers crucial for the women's suffrage movement. Unfortunately, Douglas no longer had the ear of the president, which limited his powers greatly. This is perhaps why, like many other suffragettes and suffragists that we will speak about today, he did not live to see women gain the right to vote. He died in 1895, 25 whole years before the 19th Amendment was ratified, finally granting the women the right to vote. Perhaps even more incredible than that is the fact that 100 years later, we still have not had a female president, and males continue to dominate legislation. As men, we have to stand together with women to help their voices be heard, to help them have their issues addressed. After all, like Douglas, we would not be where we are today without some very important women in our lives. Yeah. Thank you very much. And next up, we have Chris, who will be talking about Lucy Stone. Thank you, Tyler. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Julia. I'll be presenting on Lucy Stone today. Lucy Stone was born in West Brookfield, Massachusetts on August 12, 1818. She was born to Francis Stone and Hannah Matthews, who were both devoted abolitionists and instilled virtues of anti-slavery upon Lucy at a very young age. 
Lucy Stone was one of nine children. She was very different from others. Not only was she intelligent and driven, she was also brave enough to go against her parents. At just 16 years old, she ignored her parents' wish and went after a higher education. Lucy attended Mount Holyoke Seminary for one term. After four years, she enrolled at Oberlin College in Ohio. This was the first college to admit, to admit women and African Americans. Lucy entered college advocating that women should be allowed to vote and should be able to assume political office. She also felt very strongly that women should be able to speak their minds in a public forum without hesitation or fear. Unfortunately, Oberlin did not see it this way. Nonetheless, Lucy Stone fiercely excelled her way through college, becoming the first woman becoming the first woman from Massachusetts to earn a bachelor's degree. Soon after graduating from Oberlin, a colleague, William Lloyd Garrison, also a devoted abolitionist, helped her find work at the American Anti-Slavery Society, which infused her passion to abolish slavery. It also helped kickstart her career as a public speaker. At a convention for the American Anti-Slavery Society in 1847, she gave one of her most famous speeches, stating, I expect to plead not for the slave only, but for suffering humanity everywhere, especially do I mean to labor for the elevation of my sex. What Lucy means by this is she is willing to fight for the slaves and all of mankind, but is especially willing to work hard for the progression of females in all aspects. In 1850, Lucy Stone assembled the first ever National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester, Massachusetts. This was signaled as a significant moment for, mo for women, for American women. Lucy Stone became a celebrated leader. After she gave her speech at the convention, people had found it so moving it had been reprinted in newspapers nationwide. As Miss Stone would continue her career for the next several years, she would, she would keep a relentless agenda, traveling, giving speeches, promoting suffrage, equality for women, and anti-slavery. All, all the while continuing to hold and attend her annual National Women's Rights Convention. It is 1852, and Lucy is delivering yet another promising speech at the National Women's Rights Convention in Syracuse, New York. It was during this speech that Lucy is given credit for converting Susan B. Anthony to the cause of women's rights. They would continue to advocate suffrage and suffrage for women and anti-slavery for the next several years. Lucy Stone is well in her career when she decides to marry Henry, ba Henry Blackwell, who had been seeking her hand in marriage for two years. Henry Blackwell was also a committed abolitionist. It was after their wedding that she announced she would be keeping her maiden name, stating a wife should no more take her husband's name than he should hers. This led to a movement, and women who followed her example called themselves Lucy Stoners. <laughs> <laughs> after the Civil War in 1865, Lucy, began, Lucy Stone began to shift her views from fellow suffragists Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Anthony and Stanton's feud with Stone became began due to the opposition they felt toward the 15th Amendment, which only granted suffrage to African-American men. <clears throat> they felt it right to include women in the amendment as well. Stone did not see it this way. She was content with the fact that African-Americans were awarded the right to vote. She knew that this was just the first step in the right direction. Lucy Stone co-founded and became president of the State Women's Suffrage Association of New Jersey in 1869. This was the rival of the National Women's Suffrage Association due to the support that the, that the State Women's Suffrage Association gave to the 15th Amendment and the fact that they would allow prominent male reformers to help lead the cause. Lucy Stone and her husband, Henry Blackwell, also created the Women's Journal in 1870, a successful suffrage newspaper, which discussed the association meetings, suffrage issues, and detailed strategies. The newspaper outlasted the suffrage movement and Lucy herself. The, stone, the paper ended publication in 1931. Lucy Stone is credited for being an outstanding public speaker, abolitionist, and suffragist. Lucy Stone passed away on October 18, 1893, in Dorchester, Massachusetts, just 27 years before women were granted suffrage on August 1920. Although Lucy did not live long enough to see women vote, her works and efforts go acknowledged every day and will continue to do so. Thank you, Lucy Stone. Up next is Lucas. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lucas, and today I'm glad to see you guys here at the event. And coming out to the end of the event, I would like to present Lucy Burns. Miss Burns was one of the most significant leaders of the women's suffrage movement in the United States. She was arrested six times in the U.S. and spent more time in prison than any other suffragist. Born in Brooklyn, New York, on July 28, Stone, uh, Burns <laughs> uh, had, uh, was the fourth of eight children uh, from her family. Her father, a banker, supported her education, and in 1902, Miss Burns, as a brilliant scholar, received her BA in English at the Vassar College. As a professor now, she taught English for two years at Erasmus High School in Brooklyn, then pursued a postgraduate at Yale University by studying etymology and attended the University of Berlin, Germany. Ms. Burns first major experience with activism on behalf of women's, women's issues were, in, with, were with Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughter's United Kingdom. She was so inspired by their activism and charisma that she decided to drop her graduate studies in 1909 at the University of Oxford in England to join the Women's Social and Political Union, an organization that dedicated to fighting for women's rights in the United Kingdom. Burns was employed by the Women's Social and Political Union as salary salar organizer from 1910 to 1912. While working with Pankhurst, Louis Burns became increasingly passionate about activism and participated in numerous campaigns. One of her major Contributions was organizing a parade in Edinburgh as a part of campaign in Scotland in 1909. Her activism resulted in numerous court appearances and reports of disorderly conduct in the newspapers. While working with the Women's Social and Political Union, Ms. Burns uh, protest at the parliament. And then she met Alice Paul, both women who had been arrested uh, had discussed the American women's movement and their suffering experience in the United Kingdom. Ms. Burns and Ms. Powell's now bonded, all, uh, bonded over their frustration with ineffective leadership of the American suffrage movement. Their similar passions and friendliness in the face of opposition led them to become good friends. Both women were passionate <coughs> in their activism and pleaded to continue the struggle for equality in the United States. Ms. Burns once said in 1913, it's unthinkable that a national government which represents women should ignore the issues of the right of a woman to political freedom. In 1914, dissatisfied with the direction of the leadership of NASA, <coughs> Louis Burns and Alice Paul led a group of women and formed a new organization, the Congressional Union. And this Congressional Union was renamed with them as a National Women's Party now. Luce Burns was a versatile and pivotal figure with the National Women's Party and crucial source to support, uh, to support Alice Paul on her fight, her friend and colleague. Beginning in January 1917, Burns was a driven force in support of National Women Party, picking of the President Woodrow Wilson administration in Washington, D.C. Burns was arrested while picking the White House and was sent to Oconcon Workhouse, declaring that suffragists were political prisoners. She was among those uh, to the Oconcon Workhouse, and they were investigated because they were doing hunger strike. Uh, they were investigated because they were doing hunger strikes in October 1917, and subsequently placed in a solitary confinement. The Burns now jailed again when protesting the treatment of the imprisoned Alice Paul had joined with the others to another hunger strike. Burns, for that, became known as the night of terror at this day, in November 15, 1970, during which she was beaten and her arms were handcuffed about her head. She was placed in a solitary continent. She was brutal force feeding after she had been in a hunger in strike uh, for 19 days. After her release, Burns commissioned national wide speaking tours on behalf of women's right to vote. The National Women's Party, military uh, tax, and the public support its member generated 
from their imprisonment, combined with the, their persons, Loki lobby eventually forced President Wilson to endorse the 19th Amendment, yeah. amendment on January 9, 1980. The next day, it passed in the House of Representatives on June 4th. The U.S. Senate endorsed the amendment and then was enacted for a campaign that was ratified in, by 36 states. During this time, the National Women's Party sent national organizers to key states to help local National Women's Party members to coordinate this ratification. Finally, on August 8, 18, 1920, Tennessee became 13, the 36 states ratified the 19th Amendment. Unlikely Alice Paul, who remained, who remained active, uh, active in the National Women's Party until her death, Burns retired retired from public campaigns with the success of the 19th Amendment. She spent the rest of her life working with the Catholic Church. Ms. Burns, the legacy of her activism has demonstrated the energy and the force that a woman can utilize to fight against injustice. At the end, she said, I think with never any gratitude that the younger woman of today do not and can never know at a price that the right to free speech and to speak at all in public has been earned. This leads to us to keep us to keep this fight until today. We must not be shut down for those people who wants to prevent us from our rights. Thank you so much. As we have learned today, the journey of women's suffrage involved the collaborative efforts of many men and women. The suffragettes were the feminists of the time working towards achieving equality. Women and men gave inspiring speeches, created organizations, and encouraged others to join their cause. Today we can learn from their efforts and apply it to our own issues, and it doesn't have to concern gender equality. There are prevalent issues regarding other social inequalities that we can combine our efforts towards stores ending. Just like the suffragettes that we have learned about today and many others, we can learn from them that it won't be easy and we may not live to see it happen, just like the many suffragettes who actually died before seeing the 19th Amendment ratified. We can pave the way for others just like the women paved, their, paved the way for us. We hope that you have enjoyed today's event and that you leave here today inspired to work towards an equal society. Um, we actually will have some time for a question and answer, so if we can please uh, uh, introduce the rest of our the our speakers back into the uh, area. If anyone has any questions at this time? I know. Um, so, I don't know if you, you all are men, right? Okay. <laughs> so, um, so, as men, I think it's, it was interesting, number one, that you guys talk about women's suffrage, but number two, like, what do you think, in your opinion, was the most interesting facet from a male's perspective of the women's suffrage movement as you did your research for, for this, for your speech? Well, I honestly, I think that because we haven't, for us men, passing for like lack of rights, you know? We didn't put us into now, after we researched uh, those ladies uh, on what they have done, uh, we didn't put uh, us in their shoes. And I guess we must like get those information that we just passed to you guys and think about it like you guys, not the girls. So, like, if you have been like in their position, you know, you couldn't vote or like you couldn't like speak up, you know, how would you feel about it? And then act as like a community and on behalf of like the other Anyone else? Uh, I'm actually surprised by how, how much men feel threatened like, back then, especially considering even Fred, even though he was going to be 
figures of the women's suffrage movement that even he, at first, didn't actually speak for them right, he was speaking against them. So it's, I feel, like more as a society, when the whites are there, they're more willing to accept it, but before then, they're not very willing to give up. Um, how can men get more involved in women's rights on the movement? What can they do today to get more involved? I guess. Uh, yes, sure. You're going to get mad at how simple this answer is. <laughs> Literally, just listen to what women are saying. <laughs> women will say something. All right. For example. You know how there's this whole thing where people low-key want Roe v. Wade overturned? Men want that. I can guarantee you, without the stigma placed on it, any woman would want the right to say, hey look, this is my body, and I get this is another life, but that first trimester that's not another life yet. So if I don't want that, and I'm not ready for it, I should not be forced to deal with that. Um, speaking as a woman, um, like seeing you guys, like seeing them stand here today and telling you guys like about women's suffrage, as a woman speaking from like personal experience, the best thing that a man can do like to get involved in women's rights is one, yes, listen to women, but also like, don't speak for them either. Um, I know that, like, it's not necessarily, like, it's, it's important to use your voice and it's important to use, if you have, like, if you have a, a platform to discuss women's rights, it's important to discuss it and to share your opinions and share your thoughts, but it's also important to share the thoughts of other women who are probably saying the same thing as you, but just don't have the platform to do it. Um, I think that is the, probably the most important thing for me. It's just understanding that if you're a man, you have these opinions and you have the right to these opinions and you have the right to voice these opinions, but if it's taking the voice away from another woman, maybe know your place and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> strike for 19 days for your right to vote. Go, Erica. <laughs> yes. How many of you ever, women, how many of you women ever think about that before you are considering going out to vote? Like, oh, it's so inconvenient. I don't want to take the time. Do you ever think about what it took to get that right? It's also your right to not vote at the same time. So it's we live in a free country, thankfully. So I want to thank these presenters. They've worked really hard in their research and their presenting. I want to thank you all for dealing with some of the noise and um, and, and the, a little bit of crowd here. Sure, anybody has any other questions? I think that wraps it up, right? Okay. Thank you so much.